Hi everyone, I'm Rose Martin and we are right around the corner in Kinston, North Carolina with one of the, I don't know, if you think about it, what is one of your favorite shows on PBS? Would it be A Chef's Life? Well, that's where we are. We're here chatting with Vivian Howard. We're going to chat about her book, Deep Run Roots, and we'll chat about the show. So, Vivian, thanks so much for inviting us right here to Kinston. Thank you, thank so you. So tell me about the space we're in this kitchen. So this is my office. We call it VHQ, Vivian Howard Headquarters, I guess. Okay. <laughs> and it was originally uh, a tire warehouse, but my mother-in-law bought it maybe seven years ago and redid it and made it her home. And mm -hmm. she decided she didn't want to live here, so I bought it from her. Well, and of course, a Vivian Howard office would have to have a kitchen. Yes, this oh. is uh, the test kitchen where I tested all the recipes for the book and. Um, I'm working on a new book here, and this is just, it's two blocks from the restaurant, so it's really convenient. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to a young Vivian. She's what, what do you mean, back? Yeah, back, right, absolutely. <laughs> well, we'll just go to maybe a three, four-year-old Vivian. Was, were you always fascinated with the kitchen? Uh, no, no, I uh, did not grow up in a house where cooking was something that was celebrated. Eating certainly was. Mm -hmm. Um, but my, my grandmothers both were accomplished cooks, but my mom, it was, it was never really her thing. And I always saw cooking kind of as a burden, maybe because mom saw it that way. Mm -hmm. But I, I definitely grew up in a, a family where eating was an obsession. I know you. I, I get that. <laughs> I get that too, right? So growing up and enjoying food, how did you actually end up with such a wonderful career around food. Well, I, uh, when I was in college, I studied abroad in Argentina, and that was the first time that I really saw like culture and food as something that's really tied together. And I'd say that was the beginning of all of this. Mm -hmm. um, and then after college, I moved to New York. I worked in advertising. I always wanted to be a writer. And so I quit my job in advertising and I started working as a server in a restaurant to kind of like find my way in the journalism world. And I decided that I wanted to work in the kitchen as a means to maybe uh, translate that experience into a career as a food writer. Hmm. So that's how it all kind of happened. But it was in New York because you wanted to leave your small town and spread your wings and see what the world had to offer for you. And it took you where? I left home when I was 14 and went to boarding school. Went to um, an all-girls Moravian boarding school. Mm -hmm. And um, then after high school, I went to NC State and then New York. So when you were in boarding school, did you try to hide your Southern background? Try to have people not think that you were from the South? Try to do something a little different? Well, the boarding school was actually in the South, but I, um, didn't want people to know that I came from like a redneck farm. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I kind of, um, I'd say, I didn't alter my story, but I didn't share the details. Mm -hmm. Well, and from growing up in the North, like I did, there's certain things that you can just pick up on the Southern charm, but the Southern language, sometimes you say things that are a little different, or you might um, use a phrase that's, that some people aren't really familiar with. Did you run into any of those kinds of things when you were either in boarding school or heading to New York? Yeah, well, I found out, I realized really quickly when I got to boarding school that my parents um, and folks in my community didn't necessarily speak like everyone else. Um, we had a lot of uh, colloquialisms like over yonder or I'm going to carry you. Mm -hmm. um, and so I became really hyper aware of, of that. And particularly in New York, you know, I didn't want people to know that I was from the South. Right. Um, and so I altered my accent uh, in such a way that I thought that I sounded like a, a northerner, but I had people all the time ask me if I was from Australia. Oh, really? <laughs> See, you were actress right then. Uh, right I, was, I was doing something. <laughs> so you were looking to be a writer at first. Who influenced you as uh, early on that you thought, you know, I love books. I think I might want to write. Well, as a kid, I always uh, wrote stories to get attention or to get out of trouble. I know that sounds strange, but some, if something was, were not going my way at home, I'd go in my room and write my account of it. Mm -hmm. And then I'd come in and throw my little story on the kitchen table and march out, and the story would make my family laugh. 
Oh, I'd have to hear one of those. Do you remember one in particular? Um, well, I wrote a story when I was in uh, fourth grade called Santa's Private Detectives. And it was about your shoes. And at night, um, when you took your shoes off, they walked to the North Pole okay. and told Santa how you were that day. And sometimes, you know, when you woke up in the morning and you couldn't find your shoes, it was because they hadn't really, they hadn't made it back just in time to get in the right spot. There were a lot more details to it, but I feel like it was the precursor to uh, the Elf on the Shelf. Right. And I could have been a millionaire right Yeah, now. you could have been. How <laughs> clever. But that's really clever. So you were writing early on, entertaining your family, but a way to kind of express the things that you either weren't happy about or that you wanted to make your point. Right? Yes, yes. And, you know, I think we do things that people praise us for. Mm -hmm. And I always got a lot of positive feedback for my writing. And so I felt like that's what I was supposed to do. Were your parents writers? No, uh, my dad uh, is a tobacco farmer, was a tobacco farmer. My mom was a uh, first grade teacher. Um, but I would say that my dad is a storyteller. Mm. You know, so many Southern stories get carried that way, you know, where that's why they're keeping them alive. They're actually passing them down from generation to generation. Do you remember any of the stories your dad used to tell you? Or have you told those stories again to your kids? Well, my, um, my parents live across the road from me now. And so my dad comes over every morning before school. So he has the opportunity to tell those stories himself. Um, and really, his stories are more like one-liners mm -hmm. that are loaded. Uh, and great sense of humor. Yes, he has a great sense of humor. And he um, is a person who's always struggled with his weight. And um, so one of the things, I interviewed him recently because I'm writing about that. And one of his one-liners is, if you ain't losing, you're gaining. Okay. <laughs> so there's nothing, there's in, nothing for, in between. There's nothing in between. Mm -hmm. He's always either been on a, a binge or a diet. Have you altered some of your recipes at Good Southern Cooking to help him with some of that? Yeah, you know, he basically tries not to eat uh, many... Uh, carbohydrates or you know uh, anything white he says hmm. so I cook for them a lot and if I make spaghetti for my family um, I'll make the sauce and then roast a head of broccoli and and spoon the spaghetti sauce over it for him so just like little substitutions and things that I switch out what a wonderful him. daughter yeah Wonderful daughter, because we know it's going to taste good. <laughs> so a lot of times families have food traditions. Did you grow up with any type of food traditions, a Sunday afternoon meal or anything that, that you've carried on with your family? Uh, definitely. You know, we always had a big lunch after, uh, after church on Sunday. And um, my father had a relationship with a man in our community. Uh, his name was Tom Heath. And I think that Tom must have owed my dad money and um, instead of paying him money every Saturday morning Tom Heath would bring three barbecue chickens over to our house and these were uh, chickens that were uh, barbecued in the style of Eastern North Carolina style um, vinegar based barbecue and so they were like uh, smoky and vinegary and uh, slow cooked and just fantastic and my bed room is adjacent to the kitchen and so I would wake up on Saturday morning with this smell of barbecue chicken um, and so that's the food memory uh, tradition that I remember the most vividly the other one is something that we still do uh, is we have sausage biscuits on Christmas morning oh so my dad gets up at like 4 a.m. and grills sausage uh, link sausage air-dried link sausage and um, we have biscuits with um, muscadine, grape preserves, mustard, and of course sausage. I know I've read that your chicken and rice is your mom's recipe and that's kind of your comfort food, your go-to dish? Yes, I mentioned that cooking was kind of a burden for her. She has rheumatoid arthritis and has had it since she was uh, 17. And so chicken and rice was the thing that she made um, at least once a week, and it was our comfort food. It's something that I cook for my children. Um, it's something my sisters all cook for their families. So it's become a favorite? Yes. All right, so let's talk about favorites. So if I was to say favorite spice. 
what would it be? Well, my favorite spice that I currently um, use too much of is cumin, but I would say Eastern North Carolina's only spice is black pepper. Only, only spice black pepper. <laughs> yes, and amazing. actually, um, it used to be a sign of how much money you had, mm -hmm. how much black pepper you used. Um, so it more, wasn't to cover up the flavor of the food. No, no, it was um, spices were hard to get, and so the more black pepper you use, the more um, affluent you were. All right, favorite uh, vegetable? Uh, tomatoes. And I read about your tomato sandwich that you that you developed. That sounds delicious. It is, it is, and we're getting close to tomato season, so I'm. Um, I'm hankering for them. How about favorite thing to do when you're not working? Garden. I'm a big, uh, I guess gardening's not really the right term. Uh, I have a lot of house plants. I mm -hmm. would call my, the inside of my house kind of jungle-ish. And I, so I love uh, plants and like plants around my yard, but not necessarily a garden. I'm talking about perennials and uh, flowers, I guess. Mm -hmm. Which are beautiful. I read that you don't really compare people to food, except in the case of your grandma with the sweet potatoes. Tell yeah. me that story. So my grandma Hill was never very um, warm and fuzzy or not over the top in any not way. Not a cuddle grandma. No, no. She never made me feel special or anything oh. like that. Um, but I knew that she loved me. Uh, she just kind of, you know, it was no nonsense and... Uh, she made these candied yams, which it's not really even fair to call them candied yams when you compare them to all the other candied yams in the world. You know, when you think about candied yams, you think about like marshmallow and brown sugar mm -hmm. and cinnamon and honey and... Burying the yam. Right, mm -hmm. right. But uh, grandma's had just maybe like a sprinkle of, of brown sugar and a little bit of cinnamon and and that was it. And so that's how I kind of think about her. If you think about the typical, stereotypical grandma, like cuddly, yeah, warm. Yeah, over the top, yeah. Yeah, marshmallow, brown sugar, mm -hmm. and then there's Grandma Hill. Mm. You've got a great story about pecans also, and that's a favorite of yours. And it, it, traditional South or just your favorite nut and you try to use, incorporate it in what you do? Well, pecans are kind of our nut here, you know? It's like if you go to Hawaii, everybody's shoving macadamia yep. nuts at you. And uh, here in uh, Eastern North Carolina, it's pecans. And my mom grew up with uh, a yard full of pecan trees. And they were a really frugal family. And so when the pecans would fall from the trees in the morning, uh, my grandmother, uh, Grandma Hill, would get her children up and make them go out in the road and pick up all the pecans before trucks would come by and, and smash crush them. them. Oh. And that was the, then she would sell the pecans and that money was their Christmas money. Hmm. Now you put a recipe in your book um, and you talk about the, which it surprised me because I had never tasted moonshine until one of my neighbors gave it to me and I saw you put in here apple pie moonshine and I'm like, you know what? That, that's perfect. It fits right in with the, with the local flavor. And I think one of the things I love so much about you and your show is the way you'll kind of take it by an ingredient or even in your book you kind of and this is a big book but you took it by an ingredient to where anyone at home watching anyone who's going to a farmer's market or in a store can you know grab a sweet potato grab some blueberries when they're in season and create something that's delicious how did that concept come about I know that I'll go to the farmer's market or the grocery store and buy something that is beautiful, whether mm -hmm. I know what I'm gonna do with it or not. And I know that a lot of people do the same um, or get a CSA box and they've got you know a bunch of turnips and right. they're like, what in the world do I do with these? And so I think that we cook more with like the ingredients that are in front of us uh, rather than um, deciding what we're gonna make and then going to purchase it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to organize the book in that way. Uh, the, the show um, came about because I wanted to make a documentary about the dying food traditions of Eastern North Carolina. Things like hog killings or putting up corn or making collard kraut. And Let's stop right there because collard kraut I had never heard of and I read it in here how you actually had a neighbor or someone and it, the men actually did it. Let's share that story. Yeah, so Ben and I, Ben's my husband, um, we had been living here for about three years and had the restaurant. 
and maybe no, we had been here more like four or five years. And I had, um, I was cooking, you know, revamped versions of Eastern North Carolina food and kind of thought I knew everything there was to know about the region's cuisine. Mm -hmm. And I woke up one morning and there was this bag of dark brownish green leaves floating in kind of a milky liquid. And my dog like wouldn't even get near it. And so I called my dad and I said, dad, there's this strange stuff on my doorstep. Mm -hmm. I explained it to him and I said, he said, that's a gift. It's collard kraut and I believe it's from your neighbors. And so I was over the moon excited because mm -hmm. at the time I was reading this book by Sandor Katz called The Art of Fermentation. And fermentation at the time was the hottest thing in every high-end kitchen in the United States. And to learn that my geezer neighbors <laughs> were doing this uh, collard kraut, this fermented pickle, and I was studying it at the same time was just like blowing my mind. So I asked them if I could come and watch them make kraut. And they're like, sure, honey, next year when we do it. I'm like, can't you just do yeah, it like, right now? Saturday at 2? Yeah, yeah like, let's set this up. Yeah. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. We can only make kraut when the Farmer's Almanac says the moon and the stars are not in the sign of the bowels because then the kraut will rot. And I'm thinking, well, it's supposed to rot. That's what it is. Uh, and only men can make the kraut because women taint it and we only use this this special strain of collard that you know we've saved the seed every year and only well water and on and on and on mm. all this folklore surrounding the making of collard kraut and that experience really was what inspired um, a chef's life. Mm -hmm. And it's such a wonderful show our viewers absolutely love it. So what are you working on? What's next? Um, well, we're working on a new show as well as I'm working on a new book. Can you tell us a little bit about the new show? Sure. Uh, our working title is South by Somewhere, and it is in the same spirit and style of A Chef's Life in that the narrative will be um, told through my personal and professional journey. But instead of every episode being about an ingredient, every episode is about one of these dishes that every culture shares. So every culture has a dumpling, um, a quick bread, a catch-all stew, um, a way of cooking greens. And so we'll start with my culture and then um, we'll learn about two to three other cultures. And instead of going to Korea to learn about you know, a Korean dumpling, we learn from a friend of mine who lives in the South, but is um, either first or second generation. Oh, it sounds really interesting. Yeah, and I think very relevant mm -hmm. and also reflects what I'm interested in professionally. Which is what? Well, just, you know, I, I have I've cooked Southern food for quite some time and um, I'm really interested in, in learning about other cuisine mm -hmm. and also sharing that, uh, that experience of being a student in that way. And what about the new book? So the new book, uh, the working title maybe is I'm Hungry. And that sounds like a great title to me. <laughs> yeah. And it's also like Deep Run Roots, a narrative um, in that the stories will uh, determine the tone and the, um, the spectrum of the book, if you will. And it's just about all the ways that we're, that I have been hungry and some of it's about body image, some of it's about being um, driven, some of it's about um, not being able to feel full. Hmm. And so it's... So it goes in a lot of different directions. It gives people really a chance to think. Yeah. And that's one of the things I loved about this book because you took us inside your world by sharing the personal stories. A lot of times you'll pick up a cookbook and it may have a picture, it may not. It is just, it's gonna be the ingredients and then you're kinda of left to your own to see how it's gonna work. But you bringing the personal stories into the book and I found even at like 570 pages or 575 pages, it's a big book but I, I went through it page by page and I'm looking, I'm thinking, oh, so she's got her own set of Vivian's rules and all of these stories from your childhood or what you're bringing forward, I just, it was really engaging for a cookbook that I thought, what a beautiful take on it. And you know, from being from Cleveland, I've got to admit, I've never had a turnip. 
I've never tasted a turnip. I know, isn't that hard to believe? Um, but would you be willing to read something out of this book for us? Sure, and share it? sure. Let's see. Um, so I'll read the opening to the um, rice chapter. All right, set it up for us. So uh, we talked about chicken and rice, my mom's um, kind of go-to meal. And this is about an experience of me making her chicken and rice. And it's a very personal story, but at the same time, I feel as if it's very universal. Meaning that if you have a relationship with your mother, you will see some threads, some themes that you share with, mm -hmm. with your mom in here. So, uh, my mom's lifelong bout with rheumatoid arthritis has included many difficult surgeries and experimental treatments. Through it all, mom raised four girls, taught school, and bred Deberman Pinchers for spending money. As you might imagine, meals were simple at my house. Mom didn't fry chicken, canned pickles, or roll out biscuits. Instead, when Scarlett geared up to make a soul-warming meal for our family, it was almost always a pot of chicken and rice. This was our comfort food, the dish of my childhood, and probably the only thing my sisters and I all prepare for our children. As a chef and arrogant daughter, I felt I could improve on my mom's chicken and rice. I had watched her do it so many times, and each time I just knew she was cooking that chicken way too long. I believe the addition of a few aromatics like onion, garlic, and thyme would make what was already very tasty start to blow people's minds. So when my frail 70-year-old mom went under the knife for her second shoulder replacement, I decided to make her individual portions of chicken and rice for her recovery. Although never the nurturing kind, I was pregnant with twins at the time and was starting to look at all my relationships a little differently. For me, a big bowl of chicken and rice glistening with fat and thick as porridge was exactly what I craved when I was nursing a cold, a broken heart, or a hangover. Surely, my gesture would nourish mom in the same way. Two days prior to her return from the Mayo Clinic, I made a rich roasted chicken stock using backs, necks, feet, garlic, bay leaves, and mirepoix. I chilled the stock overnight and scooped off the fat the following day. Then I covered the whole chicken's with the gelatinous brown culinary, culinary wonder and brought it up to a simmer. I simmered the chickens for 10 minutes, turned the heat off, covered the pot, and let it sit for an hour. At this point, I was feeling like a genius and had started to daydream about improving the preparation of several other iconic Southern dishes. Generations to come would thank me. <laughs> Next, <laughs> really. <laughs> Next, I removed the chickens and tasted the broth. Hmm, it tastes like onions, garlic, and roasted bones. Well, I'll add some salt and black pepper. Black pepper was, after all, the one spice my mom used in excess. Oh, and maybe I should add some herbs, some thyme and rosemary, just to round out that oniony aroma. I always felt like mom's chicken and rice would have been better if it were just a little more soupy. So I forewent her measurement of one part rice to three parts broth and poured in one cup rice for every four cups of liquid. I covered the pot, turned on the heat, and went about picking the chicken from the carcass. These were some perfectly poached chickens. The juice and fat running between my fingers pleased me, patted me on the back even. I was going to make her proud. In 15 minutes, I removed the lid and stared into what looked like dark stock with some rice floating in it. It was definitely too soupy, so I decided to just let it go a little longer. I'm not sure what I thought this would do, and actually, I knew it was a bad idea, but all of a sudden, I felt desperate and had forgotten how to cook. Five minutes later, my rice had burst, broken its shape, the cardinal sin of rice cooking, and it was still floating in cups of broth. This was not at all what I had intended. In minutes, I would have a nasty country congee Scarlet would most definitely not eat. Okay, so I'll add all the chicken really fast with the heat off, cool down the broth, and stop the rice from bursting any further. I can save it. I most certainly could not save it. I did add all the chicken back to the pot, season the hell out of the mess, and got the flavor to at least an acceptable place for my misguided palate. After chilling it down, I vacuum sealed 20 small portions for my mom, drove them over to her house, and nestled them in her freezer. When mom got home, she was scary thin, weak, and a little bit crazy acting. I was seven months pregnant with two babies, scary big, and also crazy acting. <laughs> I told mom I had made chicken and rice for her to have through her recovery, and she rolled her eyes. I did my best to overlook the reaction and carried on. A week later, I walked over to my mom's to check on her reserves and found that only one bag was missing. Mom, don't forget about that chicken and rice in the freezer. You have a lot of it. 
I called from her stock freezer to where she lay on the sofa covered in blankets. Ugh, it's not good. You can't make it. Take it with you. I don't want it. Mom complained with a grimace, eyes still closed. Okay, so I knew my chicken and rice didn't top the charts, but my mom was actually pissed off about the heartfelt gesture I had made. Enough was enough. If she wouldn't receive my gift graciously, then yeah, I'd take it back. I reached in the freezer, inverted my maternity shirt to reveal my stretch to the limit belly, and shoveled the remaining 19 packets into my top. I waddled across the yard to my house, flung frozen packets of chicken and rice all over the living room, threw myself onto the sofa, and cried. Perhaps I overreacted. I was hurt that my mom didn't just eat my chicken and rice and say thank you. I'm guessing she was hurt that I had felt I could make it better. Once my mom recovered and I'd had my babies, I asked to watch her make chicken and rice her way and took an honest interest in the food of my mother's kitchen. I learned that simplicity is very hard to pull off and there are some recipes you just don't mess with. Mm. That's true. Some recipes, you just don't mess with them. And I guess you don't mess with your mama either, right? No, she, when don't. she was deciding <laughs> what she was going to do. Gosh, this has been just amazing time and it's already flown by so quickly. We're at the end of our time. So I want to thank you so much, Vivian, for sharing your kitchen, your kitchen office. Yeah. Uh, tidbits about the show, A Chef's Life, which is so popular on PBS and your book, Deep Run Roots. You are off and flying. A new show, new things happening. We just wish you all the best so thanks so much thank you thank you and it's been our pleasure and i would like to thank all of you for joining us at right around the corner because it's been about vivian howard we're in kinston north carolina make sure you tune into a chef's life and make sure to grab vivian's 575 page book deep run roots i'll see you next time right around the corner